Welcome to Talk Tennis. 2021 has been quite the year and we have had so many amazing episodes with awesome guests and topics, highly debated subjects, deep dives into all sorts of gear, pros, chatting about what they use on the court. It's been quite the year. And in this episode, I wanted to share with you some of our favorite episodes as well as your favorite episodes. So we're going to run through the top five episodes of Talk Tennis for 2021. And if you haven't listened to them before, I'm just going to give you a quick little snippet of each one so that you can take a deeper dive into the full episode and see what all Talk Tennis has to offer. But if you've listened to every episode already this year, it might be fun to revisit some of our favorites as well as your favorites. So enjoy. The first episode on our list was a global chat with a couple of our playtesters from the US as well as Australia. And we talked all about spin and strings. So you guys love to geek out on gear and we love it as well. Troy and Jay talk about their favorite spin friendly strings and how to get the most spin out of your string setup. We were saying that it would be really fun to talk about some of the best strings on the market for the best amount of spin generation, whether it's what you guys have found personally, what's tested the best in the lab and all of the things. So if someone wants to start off by saying or explaining to our audience what makes a string spin friendly, that would probably be the best place to start. Uh, yeah. Do you want me to take this on or do you want to go for it, Troy? Um, it doesn't matter to me really, um, but you know, <laughs> uh, I think I can, I can start off if you, if you guys want. Um, yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, so, you know, if you look at our tennis warehouse, if you get into the science of it, the university data and all that stuff, um, basically, you know, polyester monofilaments, co-polyester monofilaments tend to be the ones that will basically ac accentuate or help maximize uh, spin potential of mm -hmm. how a player hits the ball and imparts the spin on the ball. So, I mean, for example... Nadal uses a full bed of RPM blast, you know, or, or teams using uh, a full bed of RPM power, two guys that, you know, probably hit some of the most top spin on the tour, even though just about most guys on tour hit crazy amounts of spin. But basically um, those strings are uh, very control oriented, uh, low powered, um, which really allow that, that aspect allows the player to, to swing freely um, maximize racket head speed, swing big, um, you know, use their, their technique to generate that spin. So that's a big part of it. Uh, but the science of the string, you know, more exactly. And I've kind of gotten more into it over the years, talking to Crawford, the, the one who runs our tennis warehouse university is basically there's kind of two things that, that really are going on with the string and the ball interaction. And it's, um, you know, basically um, the amount of friction or the bite from the string into the felt of the ball which is kind of obvious nowadays with like so many shaped strings, gear shaped, really rough strings. You're really trying to grab the ball, rip into the felt. But the other part of it that kind of is something that I kind of learned over the years was more of the string on string interaction. So talking about like your main strings versus your cross strings, there's a big part of the friction or the coefficient of friction between those strings. So basically in the equation uh, of it all, you're really wanting to maximize string to ball friction the amount of friction between the the grip on the ball you know the the, the way the strings grab the ball mm -hmm. and you want to minimize or reduce the amount of friction between the mains and crosses so maximizing string on ball friction and minimizing string on string friction is what kind of i take from it well yeah i, so, yeah, I was gonna say yeah. jay that was, that was, let's that hear was your... pretty much you've <laughs> taken everything um pretty much out of the book um yeah so yeah you you hit the nail on the head i and it, all of that is like on the our um the tennis Mercy university page as well and i think every, everyone can go onto that page and they can start diving into um take a look um i think that's like that's a huge database there and you can take a look at all the all the different strings compare um one to to another and i can say that i'd like any time that i look at uh, a different string like i automatically go to go to that university and I, I just like i just look at the the differences straight away um and it's very helpful and it's super accurate as well so and, and like you do notice the differences so um yeah so what, what are your top five troy <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> we're getting in it like let's yeah. go <laughs> i don't know necessarily if i have a, a 
a set top five of just yeah. what are, you know, just for spin, you know, pretty much all the polys I like give me the spin I need type of thing. But, you know, like, yeah. wait, wait, wait. I have a question <laughs> before we get too far into it. I, just because I just reviewed a string and I wanted to ask you guys, do you find that strings with more edges or less edges or more spin friendly? Or is there a magic number of edges? Do the edges wow. really exist? <laughs> <laughs> i'm not a that's a tough one that's a tough one um yeah. i don't know I, f- I feel like um it might just be more of a sensation thing for me but yeah strings that have that are more edgier like specifically like four or five edges i feel like personally i i feel um the string grab the ball more not i don't know if it necessarily you know like will produce you know, um, more spin, um, because obviously there's that string to string friction as well, but, but there are definitely some strings like, you know, hyper G or cyclone where like you just, if you hit that ball right in the middle, you can actually feel the strings just grab it and, and, and yeah, rip the felt. So that's, that's what I found. Um, (laughs) (laughs) you Troy. Yeah. I, I agree with what you're saying there. Um, I do know, you know, like we're talking about hyper G and then like, if you look at the tennis warehouse university, like the top five or so, uh, strings, pretty much all of them are that square shape, the, uh, ultra cable vocal V square name. The name is square, uh, black code four S four sides. Um, all of those, um, square shaped strings. So there's gotta be something in that, in that uh, shape and the way it equates out, you know, in the university that, uh, that maximizes it. And yes, there's a, there's a ton of different strings with a ton of different sides. Like RPM blast is supposedly an eight sided string octagonal. Um, but when you string RPM blast and you like really get like into the texture of it, it doesn't really feel sharp. It's very slick. So I think the magic of RPM blast is more in the, String on the sleekness string. of it, yes. yeah, yeah, just how easy that it guards, yeah. One of our biggest projects of 2021 was to learn more about tennis balls, how they're made, what separates the premium balls from a champ ball, and all of those things. So, if you take a peek into the episode that Troy and I recorded all about tennis balls, you're going to learn some stuff real fast and probably want to check out the full episode. Let's check it out. So, let's go into the na- the anatomy of a ball a little bit. And I know even before we started diving into all this research, like I had heard about the punch needle balls versus the woven balls, but I think we can now break it down even better for our listeners. So let's just start with the materials and how they're applied to the ball and what differences you might see and what creates a different experience yeah so um i mean the three main components when you break down the ball are going to be you know just from a a general looking at the ball the the yellow fuzzy stuff the felt um beneath that layer is the core which is typically a a rubber a natural rubber or synthetic rubber or a a mix of the two so you got the uh, the outer surface the felt the core and then on the inside it's you know typically most balls uh, are hollow and typically most balls are pressurized with, you know, it's usually just the natural air um, that they fill it with, but it's uh, a certain pressurization depending on the ball. And then whether it's, you know, the core plays a part with the pressure. So, you know, if it's like a thicker, like talking like a cheap ball, like a really cheap ball, like a pressureless ball that we sell, we sell like the bags of pressureless balls. Right. um, Those have no, like uh, they're not filled with a certain amount of pressure. It's just uh, an empty core, but they have a lot thicker, uh, rubber shell so that's right. kind of what what makes those cheaper balls last so long yeah. yeah but those are the three main pieces is the felt the core and then the air that it's filled with okay but, um if we want to get it specifically just the, one of the main key differences talking about the felt of the ball um what you'll really notice and kind of what you already touched on um the premium balls typically speaking are going to be a woven felt so that's the the construction of how they put the fibers together. So uh, one of the the vendors that we spoke to did a really good job explaining it to us, but um, 
kind of the analogy he used was with that premium premium woven felt, the construction of being woven, kind of like a handmade, um, a handmade rug, you know, so the way they weave the fibers together is really a, a mix of a really strong construction for the fibers and gives you sort of that premium felt. So the woven design is, is construction is on most premium balls. And then even further than that, the actual fibers themselves um, on a premium ball, they're typically, so pretty much all m- most tennis balls are going to be a, um, a mixture of natural fibers, natural wool fibers, and mm-hmm. some sort of like nylon synthetic, synthetic material. Yeah. The premium balls are usually more of a majority of natural uh, wool fibers. So kind of, you know, the majority of the fibers on those premium balls are natural, a little bit of synthetic mixed in. And then as you go down in price to the really, you know, lower price point stuff, uh, going down to like a champion ball, which we carry a, a few different types of championship balls from the brands. And then even lower than that, like your pressureless balls or something like really cheap, you might find at like a convenience store or something like that. Yeah. Um, those are, as you go down, you're going more and more uh, synthetic nylon fibers. Um, to the point where the really cheap stuff is going to be fully, fully synthetic. So not only is the construction matter, the woven premium, uh, but the type of fibers, so more natural fibers. Um, and then as you punch, or as you mentioned with the, uh, like the championship ball, like the step down in price on our website for those balls, um, they're mostly the construction on those is a needle punch. So mm-hmm. pretty much just what it sounds like, um, you know, the needle is punching the thread into the, you know, the, the base of that, that felt that then gets applied to the core. So it's a faster kind of, um, you know, more mechanical process and it just doesn't really construct that, that kind of like premium, you know, strong, really strong weave as, as well as the woven. Yeah. Which is like, once you stop to think about like what goes into the manufacturing of a single tennis ball, it's pretty wild. And when you're playing with those premium options, it's like, okay, this is not only a premium material that comes from wool and then it's like woven in and like attached. Yeah. It's just, I know a lot of people that we talked to were saying, if you could even see the process, players would be shocked at like, what what it takes to make a tennis ball that like some of us will like go play for an hour and then kind of just like discard as if like oh okay (laughs) oh yeah yeah and uh, (laughs) you know as far as the price point on the balls you know it's it's gone up you know over the years and whatnot since i've worked here but yeah the more you know about the factory and the processing of the balls it's like you're almost surprised that they're not double the price that they are now not that like exactly we want to pay more but it, it's really an intricate process and uh, a lot goes into the details of how that that ball's made in 2021 we had an opportunity to chat with so many pro players but one of my favorite and i think one of your favorites as well was daniel medvedev he is well-spoken. He's got such a great energy. He knows a lot about his gear and he's just an all around unique character. So check out a little snippet from that episode and learn a little bit more about Daniel Medvedev and his gear. So on this podcast, we love to talk to players about their gear and you have some awesome gear that you're out there with as your weapon of choice. So let's talk a little bit about Technofiber and the brand and how you came to start working with Technofiber. What was that relationship like? How did you start working with them? When was the first time you even picked up a Technofiber racket? First time I picked a Technofiber racket, I was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 19 years old. Uh, no, I was 18 years old, uh, just uh, about to turn 19. And uh, they came with an offer because my contract with the previous brand was expiring. So I was thinking, uh, how do I continue my career? I was uh, 330 at the time. I think I finished the uh, year 331 or something, something around this. I was the end of uh, 2000. Um, 16, I would say, if I'm not mistaken, I might be. No, probably 2015. And uh, Technofiber was, well, yeah, one of the brands that uh, showed the most um, interest, I would say, in me. So I was like, okay, I need to try the record. I need to see how it works out. And uh, I really liked the approach because straight away I made, uh, met um, the main, uh, how we can call it, the main coordinator between players and the brand. Um, he doesn't work there anymore, Guillaume. Uh, uh, Ducre, but uh, I really, uh, yeah, he's a really nice guy, and he he kind of brought me to Tecta Faber, one of the guys also, 
And uh, I remember very well first two tournaments uh, were, were challengers in Bangkok. And I was not playing that well. I won one round, but I was not playing amazing. And of course, straight away after you've been playing uh, with something for all your life, you start questioning yourself. So right. did I make the right choice? Is my career uh, going to be uh, good with this racket? Am I going to be, to be able to play good? And well, the year I started 330, so I had the top 10 questions in myself and I finished the year 98, which is a huge wow. uh, <laughs> progression. Yeah, and I was... Uh, I was not talked about in the media. I was not, the, you know, how called the next gen and everything. Nobody cared about me, but I made a huge step. I think at the time when I finished top 100, I was maybe one of the five, six guys of my age who were there, which is, uh, which was really good, was really important to me. And uh, since that year, I mean, I love the record. I, I was <laughs> playing amazing. Uh, completely honest, you can ask other junior guys. I had a huge problem on my forehand before. Like you could play on my forehand and you could win the match just by doing this. Um, and my backhand was really good. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, it might sound stupid or anything, but with Spectrum Fiber Racket, I, uh, I managed to, to play much better forehand. So it, uh, it was not any more a weak point in my game. And that's how I managed to be in the top 100. And then it was only going up from there. And I still play with this racket. And uh, I don't think I will ever change uh, during my career. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, that's awesome. I think that's, uh, that's not many times I tell this story. So it's going to be something new. That's always uh, nice to, to give something new to, to fans and to people who follow me. It's always fun to connect with the people who are creating and developing the products that we use on the court. And our episode with the guys from Head in Austria, Ralph and Martin, was very fun to say the least. Plus, it was very educational. Um, in this little snippet, you're going to be able to hear about the evolution of the radical frame of rackets and how they got to the current one that is on the market now. We love that racket in 2021. One. So take a listen into what makes this racket so special. How have you seen the racket evolve since then, though? Like, walk us through the progression to today where we've got the newest Graphene 360 Plus version. Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> it was like, great. I didn't, it was a good. Uh, no, we thoughts. can shortly go through it. You yeah, know, let's do this, it. Well, yeah, we got here the, you know, the old one, the first one which is what it was at that time. And in Europe, it was called the Radical Tour. I think in the US, was it the Trisis? Trisis, yeah. 280, I mm -hmm. think. I think the Trisis 300 was the Prestige uh, Tour, and the Trisis 260 was the Pro Tour at that time. Uh, well, yeah, the nickname, of course, of the record Bumblebee. Uh, I remember myself playtesting the record in 1993, and yeah, it was a great record. Uh, of course, you know, it was, uh, so to say, if you compare it to the broad tour, a bit more on the stiffer side, but at that time, very successful. Then if we go on, there was the, the first twin tube bracket, which was launched around uh, 1995. And I think the nickname is the Zebra because of, yeah, the special look. And uh, yeah, some really nice details like, you know, you have here material and yeah, the, because of the twin tube, the, the playability, the feel was a bit softer. It was a bit, let's say, more plush. It was not that stiff, not, not that direct, but in the end, also a huge success. That was my, that was my college racket, Ralph. I used oh, that. Okay. Yeah. okay. <clears throat> so I was in college 94 to 98 and I, I switched to that racket in college. So I old finished, memories. Fin so. Yeah. Finished college with it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was also in the club I played. I played at that time the Prestige Tour uh, 600 and a, a friend of mine, he played this one and yeah, absolutely loved it. It was a great record. And then uh, there was one uh, other version of uh, this Radical, which was, I think it was launched around beginning of 1998. I don't actually know the nickname of this. I mean, it's again, a lot of different colors. It was also a twin tube racket. And uh, what is interesting here, you still see the pretty curved shaft geometry, you know, it's really, it goes out of the grip, uh, kind of parallel to the length axis, and then it's uh, really very curved. And this was then slightly changed when we move on to the titanium radical, which was a new geometry, new shape. And well, uh, it's, I take the other one again, maybe might be difficult to see it here, but it is slightly kind of straighter, this one. 
you see it. So here we had a new shape, uh, a new mold, new geometry uh, was optimized. And also, of course, at that time, two dramatical changes. First, the weight was reduced a lot. We went down to 295 grams on this one. And the other change, uh, of course, for R&D, not at all important, but yeah, we got the orange color. <laughs> so this was basically, I think, the first one, you, you know, where, yeah, the the kind of radical orange yeah. came to the market. The silo color orange. Then intelligence radical, also very popular, uh, the cat eyes. And yeah, I think introduced in about 2001. We move on to the liquid matter radical, which was a, a different mold. And here with the radical at that time, it was the first time that there was a tour version of the MP. It was, I think at that time, radical MP tour was the same mold, was the same string pattern, but was I think about 320 grams, if I remember correctly. Also twin tube bracket. Also, yeah, very kind of uh, soft plush feel. Uh, we move on to the flex point radical, uh, similar mold, and uh, yeah, again here we have the real orange, clearly in your face, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, this was uh, also we have uh, still the total sweet spot construction here, which was uh, brought into the line with the liquid metal radical. Then we we move on to the microgel radical, uh, was a new mold. Uh, but let's say the, the changes were not dramatically, but were, so to say, subtle, uh, but still kind of, yeah, small revisions. Uh, it was this one as well as with the flex point there, the tour or pro version was now a different mold. It was a 645 head size. And yeah, we go on to the UTEC radical. This was now really, again, a, a totally different mold. The cross sections were kind of, yeah, thinner, slimmer. And uh, yeah, uh, still the 1820 pattern, uh, a record, uh, I think very popular, uh, but also let's say partly for some players, it was a bit too, so to say soft or flexible. Uh, other players loved it for that. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, special, so to say playability. Uh, the UTEC IG Radical was then same mold. Uh, the biggest change here, we optimized the playability, fine-tuned it, but also here uh, the pro version was now made of, out of directly this mold and was the first time with a 1619 pattern. So the MP still had the 1820 and the pro version had the 1619. Yeah, and then we have the, the new shape, which was then introduced in 2014, graphene. And I remember pretty well the internal meetings at that time you know, a lot of discussions moving away from the 1820. In the end, I think it was the right decision simply because of the 1619 offering, yeah, a bit more power, a bit more kind of forgiveness. And if you think about how the game changed, uh, this simply fits to the yeah change of the game. Was here, of course, a, a total new geometry, total new shape. Uh, the balance was reduced uh, by 10 millimeter, so extremely maneuverable racket. And then over the years, we got the Graphene XT, where we fine-tuned the, the layup, uh, worked on the layup, uh, and also, yeah, of course, the Razzle Dazzle cosmetic, <laughs> very special. And then we had Graphene Touch Radical. Uh, here, uh, the playability, the target was uh, to, you know, make it really as comfortable as possible. But of course, there's the comfortable, uh, yeah, it's a kind of, well, it's a fine line, making it comfortable, but still having enough connection. And I think here, some players absolutely love this record. However, we have to admit, some also say, no, not for me. Uh, this is always, I think, yeah, here it's a personal taste. How much really feedback, how much connection do you want to have with the record? And then, of course, Graphene 360. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, since R&D doesn't have a lot of budget, we don't have the new one. This is only uh, testing has the new one. <laughs> I have all the records. <laughs> we Martin. only got the old stuff. Martin, you want to take us through the, the new one? You, I know you got it. I can show it, but Ralph has to tell you all the details. <laughs> yeah, the details are, I mean, it's not, uh, not extremely that you say uh, 
totally different. You know, it, it doesn't have now a lollipop shape or whatever. But as mentioned, the, the head size, uh, the head shape, it's slightly wider, uh, thereby offering uh, more forgiveness, a bigger sweet spot. And also we fine tune the cross sections to optimize this feel and also fine tune the strength pattern. What I like a lot is that we uh, decided to have two molds again or even three modes with the S because the S is also a very good record. It's, it's, it's slightly bigger, 660. What is it in, in US? It's 102 inch, square inch, I guess. Um, but as I said, the Pro is a different, different mode to the MP, which was, was not the case the, the last years. And uh, yeah, the, the beam is slightly uh, thinner than, than with the MP. And I guess this is really, uh, yeah, nice for for consumers or for for players to have two different options and if you want the mp heavier of course it's it's 300 320 and the, and the pro is is heavier but uh, i know the guys especially on on your board your 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 uh, on the message board yeah 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 they they like to to tune their records a lot and to to pimp them and yeah this was this is possible with the mp for sure it's a good uh, platform record i guess for customizing you've spent a lot of time obviously testing the line do you have a favorite out of the new radicals i'm i'm also not the youngest as ralph so uh, i tend to heavier records because back in the in the times it, it, it was all the records were, were much heavier than nowadays so so the pro is in terms of spec what 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 I like and also the record is is more control oriented a little bit um, in in the direction of a prestige with which is my my favorite record all all the years. Um, but the MP definitely is is uh, yeah easier easier to play and and but I can't I can't tell you which which I like more. It's it's both of them are have their their positives and and uh, I like both. I can't That's decide. That's the tough question. Like if you ask, hey, which of your kids do you like most? <laughs> always you know the you one have that an is, <laughs> always the one with the good manners at the moment. You know? Yeah, depends on the day. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and last but not least, one of our favorite episodes, as well as yours, was our great debate pro or con vibration dampeners so mark boone and chris debate the pro con damp situation and i'm not sure if there was a winner but go take a listen and see which side you fall on we have a very controversial topic today to damp or not to damp we're going to full on throw down and i have mark boone and chris edwards here Please uh, say hello and introduce what side of the argument you are going to be taking today. So are you here to keep it civil, kind of mediate? I'm the the mediator. (laughs) So Chris, what side will you be representing today? I am the no damp side. And I want to point out to people that are just listening, they're not watching the video, um, that I'm wearing a polo. So my opinion will be a little bit more official than uh, than someone who says in just a crew neck top. Oh, (laughs) we've already gotten some uh, trash talk started. We started that in the office before (laughs) Um, Booney. Well, by default, obviously, I'm on the uh, pro side of the decision tree in terms of uh, wearing a dampener. (laughs) Wearing a dampener. (laughs) Okay, well, um, I feel like Chris has an unfair advantage because his wife is a lawyer and actually knows how these things go. Um, fun fact, I do have a pre-law degree, but, uh, I'm, I'm not well versed in this. However, you know what that means, right? It just means I'm really good at losing arguments. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I believe. <laughs> here's, a, here's a practice. <laughs> um, I would, uh, do my best to mediate this, uh, little debate and give both sides, um, a chance to state their argument and then, uh, rebuttal the arguments. Um, I have to also admit that I'm a little biased because I am on team no damp. So um, I'm going to, I should flip a coin, but I'm going to let Mark Boone take the start of this conversation. Give us your affirmative statement on why players should be using a dampener. 
All right. Well, in the end, just to kind of keep it friendly, and I know you said that from the start, let's keep it friendly. Um, mm-hmm. I think you should try it both ways. We all know who loves to say try it out. That's some of the best advice I've gotten out of here and all this time you guys let me clock in every day. Try it out both ways. There is a difference. Uh, I have been on both sides of it. I've kind of flip-flopped. I've fallen off the train, got back on the wagon, so to speak. And I prefer having a dampener in there, maybe not the worm dampener, because that seems to sponge up almost all of the feel. I like a little feedback, uh, but I like the the more dampened sound, especially if I'm playing with a multi with a dampener. Um, with a poly, not as much of a major thing, but it's a placebo effect. I'm used to having it in there and I feel like I'm missing something if I don't. So I've just admitted that it's a psychological thing for myself. Okay. And we're done. (laughs) Okay. Chris, I know you've also dabbled pro and con, but currently you are no dampener. We do not need anything dampening the ball on our string bed. Give me your arguments. Um, So I used to use a dampener and like Booney, if I talked about it, you know, I started out with a rubber band tied in the knot because I was an Agassi fan. Uh, I also followed his hairstyles pretty much exactly (laughs) (laughs) through my life. Um, And uh, when I started at Tennis Warehouse and I started playtesting, I really wanted to feel the racket. And I hear the racket one time, someone who wasn't using a dampener handed it to me. And I was like, you know what, I I feel like I'm feeling more of the ball interacting with the string bed. Um, So whether I'm string play testing or racket play testing, I just felt I wanted to get that just pure, unadulterated feel of the racket as it is with no damp. And so that was basically the only reason why I stopped using a dampener. I actually like the sound, you know, that gives you a bit more of a thwack than a ping when you've got a string dampener in there. Um, So I like the the sound, you know, more of a a pong pong than a ping ping. That's an internal teed up joke Um, kind of guy. And so, yeah, I can, I get why, you know, someone like Booney loves using a damp and it does feel good with a damper. And I think, especially for using a poly, but um, for me, just play testing, I want to get that hundred percent feel of what is going on. So I stopped using dampeners and now that I don't use them, you know, I don't miss them at all. And actually when I do get a racket and it's got a dampener in, I take it out immediately just because it does, there's a different feel. And so I'm so used to the feel without that, uh, but now I stick without. I can back you up on that. Anytime we trade rackets, I get the dampener with it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he hands me the racket. I hand him the dampener back. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were discussing too, our play testing crew is pretty divided also. So I wouldn't say there's like one trend one way or the other. Cause I know Booney, you're pro Troy also uses one. I think we said that Andrew uses one and Kristen uses one and Sage uses one. And then on the con side, (laughs) Chris does not use one. Britt does not use one. Tiff does not use one. Jay does not use one. And I do not use one. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, as well as all the episodes from this year. We had so much fun, as always, recording these. And we're so excited to see what 2022 brings. Send you all lots of love, health, and happiness for the new year. And happy hitting. Happy hitting.